Hello and welcome to Almost 30 Podcast. Hi, everybody. Welcome to the show. It's your girls. Lindsay and Krista, we're so glad you are here. We are long-haired girlies. Wow. We're, I just got a cut, though. My Wow. You want to hear? Great. So my friend, I saw her at another friend's party. Mm -hmm. I was like, your haircut's amazing. It's hard to get a good cut, I think. I don't like when they razor the hair. Yeah. I don't like when they thin the hair. I want my hair to be thick and huge. Like yeah. I don't want any weight off. I don't want very specific long layers, heavy at the bottom. She's like, yeah, there's this woman. She's a hundred dollars. She'll come to your house. And Sounds she right. gave me her number. Didn't look at her social media. Just had this woman come to my house. This is she typical rolled, like, Krista, a little. Though. <laughs> this is very typical. Honestly, very typical. You always, it always works out, but you'll be like, yeah, I've never seen this girl's color. Like color talent. I'm going to go get my hair mm -hmm. highlight, full head of hair highlighted. <laughs> yep. I, I follow my intuition to random things. Like <laughs> there's a lot, I could use my intuition in better things, but for random things, I just follow it. So she rolled her little card in. We washed my hair in the sink. She took an hour to cut it. I was terrified because when they start taking a long time and they keep snipping and snipping, mm -hmm. it's a scary thing for someone like me. So I was like, okay, here we go. And she just did such an amazing job. It's the first time I've had like an actual cut yeah. in a really long time. I just like having long hair. I feel like it's like a safety blanket. Same. If I feel ugly, I can just put my hair in front of yeah. my face. <laughs> like just a whole thing. <laughs> you can look like cousin it. Yeah, I completely yeah, honestly. I completely agree. And and a good cut is hard to do. I'm looking for you like a great a cut. Bouncy ass blowout. Like I feel yeah, like every time I get cut. a blowout, it's so fucking blah. But I also think a good haircut coupled with a good blowout is the shits. So so if this is your first time tuning into Almost 30 Podcasts, we are a beauty podcast. Yeah, we true. talk about hair. We talk about... <laughs> I'm just kidding. We are spirituality and wellness. We are two best friends that live on opposite coasts. Lindsay is in Brooklyn. I'm in Los Angeles. We've been doing this since 2016, and we're so glad to have you here. Today's episode with Matthew Hussey is such a good one, and I'm really excited for you guys to listen to it. I felt like I was talking to Lindsay after I sent her a voice note, and I was telling her that I feel like it is a side of Matthew that you may have never seen. We had so much fun. We were laughing so much. We were joking. And yet there was so much depth. And um, he has a book that is out now called Love Life, the same name as his podcast. It is an incredible book. I got to read the galley before anyone else. And I felt like it was just super powerful. So I'm really excited for you guys to hear the conversation with Matthew Hussey today. It's full of gems. Um, we've been Matthew Hussey fans for a while, but I think to your point, like, you know, you see a side of someone, whether it's on their social media or wherever else you like take in their content. And so I, I attribute it also to like your talent of just making people feel incredibly comfortable mm -hmm. when you're talking to them. Um, so I'm excited to listen and see this side of Matthew. We have a YouTube as well, where you can watch these episodes. Um, but what was your, I guess, what did you walk away from the conversation feeling kind of more enlightened about, especially since you are someone who is now dating out mm -hmm. in the world, doing her thing? So for anyone that's new um, to Almost 30, I was in a relationship for a long time, 10 years. We were married and I'm newly single. So I, I've been single for about a year now and I've been dating a little bit. So Matthew's content has been helping me to understand the dating world because I have no idea what's going on after 10 plus years. I have, it's just, it's a whole journey. Mm -hmm. So um, something that I really loved that he said, I just, I loved it. I was asking about, um, having expectations and then having walls up because I feel like a lot of times women and men will use high expectations as a way to protect themselves, as a way to put up walls, as a way to expect the other person to be everything that they wish they could be or everything that they're not. And sometimes the expectations or the, sorry, the standards that people have. So having standards, people will say, I have a standard. My man has to make this much. My woman has to do this thing. You know, you kind of have this like list of things. And he was saying, he's like, women oftentimes have standards for the wrong things. So a woman will say like, a man should be making this amount of money. He needs to have multiple houses. He needs to do these things. And he's like, what about a man that's nice to you? <laughs> what about a man that listens to you when you're talking? What about a man that's like kind and compassionate? And it was such a light bulb moment because I think for me, you know, as an example, I have my list of everything I'm looking for and my partner and all of that. And when I look at my list, everything at the top is sort of the ego things, you know, 
He's got more than one house, that type of thing. It's on my list. And then as it gets lower, you know, the more I was able to sink into my heart and my truth of like what I'm looking for, it is the, the intangible things. It's like amazing eye contact, like great body language when I'm speaking to him, like he expands um, my mind, like he is able to keep up with me socially, you know, all of these things that I'm really looking for truthfully, because I will even say, in my, in previous relationships I've had, I've had the manifestation list and I've had that manifestation list come to life. I've had it actually happen. And it didn't have any of those really important qualities that I'm looking for, which are emotional maturity, Mm -hmm. you know, deep capacity to love, like compassion, like all of these things. And then I got the list, but I didn't get the things that I really, really needed that were really heart centered. So I just really loved that reframe that he shared. I guess what is the, cause you mentioned the expectations or the standards, the high standards are kind of like the wrong choice standards as like walls. Mm -hmm. Is that right? Like kind of, I guess I was, that's kind of my perspective. And I'll explain that. So sometimes I feel like the standards that women put up are men. It's like you go out in the world and your girls are like, what are you looking for? And you're like, I need a man that's making 500 K. He needs to be six, four. He has to be, you know, doing all of these things. And it's almost in a way a protective mechanism of like, you know, cause the truth of your heart is that your heart is looking for someone that's going to deeply love you and see you. So it's almost just like, I'm going to say all these things yeah. so that people think that I'm worthy of them or deserve them. Like, I just think that there's an air of protection or a wall there because I think if we're saying that repeatedly, then we're sort of narrowing our scope of what we're looking for. And then we're not being open to like what necessarily is really truly meant for us. And it kind of keeps us away from like the truth of what our heart wants and really more so like what our ego is looking for. Completely. And I remember, I remember having those like more egoic desires within a relationship or more like surface level and to desire something as, you know, simple and profound as like someone who, um, is like a deep listener and is so engaged Mm -hmm. and like is interested about my life, my feelings, my, all of these things would actually require me to go to that place. And I think for a long time in my life when I was symbol, symbol, when I was symbol, when I was single, (laughs) um, I didn't want to go there. It felt like too much yeah. effort. It felt like I would hit something that was like kind of icky about myself where I wouldn't be perfect at it. And so I think to stay on that surface level is actually much easier for women today who are like really busy doing the most kind of yes. overwhelmed, like nervous system overwhelmed for many reasons. So I totally, totally get it. Um, and I also think that from my experience in dating, when I started to attract the more people who actually aligned with the emotional, deeply connected aspects and values that I wanted or uh, aspects of people that I desired, um, my comparisonitis went up. And what I mean by that is most of the time those people came in different packages than I had initially set out to find. So maybe they were shorter than I really desired, or maybe they had just like a different look. Maybe they were a blonde and I was used to dating brunettes, which can totally trip up the mind and also cause me to compare to like who my friends were dating. What did their partners look like? And I would forget that I was getting actually exactly what I needed in someone. Um, they were kind, they were considerate, they were great listeners, they were consistent, but I would often be distracted by the fact that they came in a package that was different than like the top aesthetics on my list. Yeah, of course. Yeah, of course. And I think the reframe, you know, for anyone listening is just like, you can have the list, like do whatever you want, you know, have the list of everything, the expansive list. I'm not lying to say that I don't have mine, but it's also just remembering that the things that make a long-term healthy, sustainable, loving relationship are not always the things that like you see on the resume or you see on the paper. Um, And then another reframe that he had that I just loved so much was thinking about, oh, I'm just laughing at myself with it. Thinking about 
how in dating you have these situations with people where you have this, like these magical moments where you have, you know, a few dates with them or you meet them in London or you meet them abroad or you meet them on vacation. And you have these like really magical moments where you spend just enough time to like get the hits of all of these amazing qualities of this person, you know, kind of like what they're like so funny and cool and charming and da, 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 da. He's like, and then oftentimes people will use that as a barometer for what they're looking for. And that's actually not like a real relationship. Like, you know, if you are with someone for longer than two years, you're going to pass that stage of all of those ideals. You're going to pass that like dopamine stage, that like intense chemistry stage. And so it's like not really fair to have these like fantasy romantic moment experiences be a barometer for judging what you're really looking for in a relationship because you're really looking for someone that's going to love you as a person and see you as like a whole being. Yeah. I mean, I remember at the beginning of my relationship with Sean, I wanted to extend that like magical, I don't, I guess honeymoon phase, but it's more what you're speaking to. It's like the, the vacations, the like last minute little trips and experiences that you do. And I would, I was like going overboard where I'm like, why don't we do like a staycation at like a hotel this weekend? He's like, what the, what? He's like, we did that. We like went away the other week. Why don't we just like chill? Why don't we just be in each other's presence? Why don't we just like hang? And I was like, so not okay with kind of coming back down to earth and mm-hmm. like being kind of in the mundane moments with him because I was nervous that it wouldn't be interesting for him or like, was I enough? Like I had so much to say about me. Um, and how I was to be perceived in those more mundane moments rather than like, you know, sexy in my robe at the hotel and like mm. going for couples massages. Say less. <laughs> yes. Say less. Honestly, <laughs> say less. Yeah. It's, and it is, I think what happens too, is a lot of time you fill in the gaps with the people that you have, you know, the four dates with that are amazing. And you're like, Oh, our connection. And then you're kind of like, wow, you know, you just think it is more than what it is because you're only seeing the the positive sides of it. But I think for anyone listening, there's just so many gems in here that you're going to get from this conversation with Matthew. Um, I just really loved it. So if you did too, share it with a friend. I think it's super helpful to talk to your friends about this, especially when it's fun conversations like dating. Um, I think a question too that we went into that I really enjoyed was about how I have this perception that women shoulder all the work in this, like where I feel like women are have full-time jobs. They are managing their social life. They are managing their side hustles. They're managing their families and they're managing all these things. And then also they're taking on the role and responsibility of managing the relationship, finding the person, navigating this. And there's a part of me that just kind of gets resentful at times because I know that men are seeking support and men are, you know, doing their own work in their own ways. But it's like, it just sometimes makes me mad because I feel like women are just trying to figure out this game of a man and trying to like understand like what it is that I need to do and how do I need to change and how do I need to evolve and how do I need to like adjust for someone? And it just kind of, yeah, I just kind of sometimes get sad because I'm like, can't we just, I know. Can, can we, we take just a, have a them be doing the all this freaking research? Yeah. <laughs> Can't we? Like, shouldn't they, as pursuers, be the one that's like trying to educate themselves on us? Like, why is this? Exactly. <sighs> yeah, I think we can like kind of take a page out of their book in the sense like the. I think they can take a page out of ours, and we can take a page out of theirs, mm-hmm. where there is less. Of that's a good one. Mm-hmm. Doing the most on our end, doing the most, over functioning, um, and just kind of leaning back a little bit more. And allowing, because we've talked about this, where it's like, if we are so leaning in and uh, desperately trying to make things work or like planning things or, or yes. you know, driving the growth within the relationship, they have no room to step in and step forward. Like, unless they are super evolved and aware, I feel like that is a hard energetic for them to kind of push past. And so if we create the space and then also communicate like, hey, I'm really wanting to work on this like between us within our relationship, then hopefully with a, you know, a collaborative effort, he's able to step in because you've created this space and kind of step back. But yeah, I completely agree. Women shoulder a lot of it. I know. Mm-hmm. Less, 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 less. less. Um, so yeah, Matthew is just amazing. I was telling Lindsay, I just deeply enjoyed our our conversation. I deeply enjoyed his company. He's so 
kind and non-judgmental and open and intuitive and just very much non-judgmental in his work. You know, I really do believe it's it would be a hard space, I think, for me to consume content from a man telling me how to date in that way. But he just does it in such a really beautiful, clear way that's deeply loving. And so I think his work is amazing. He has his YouTube, he has his podcast. And again, the book is called Love Life. And you can go to matthewhesse.com to pre-order that now or to order that now. It's how to raise your standards, find your person and live happily no matter what. Mm. So good. Thank you all so much for listening. We are almost 30. You can learn more about Almost 30 at almost30.com, almost30.com. Be sure to follow us on Instagram and on TikTok at Almost 30 Podcast. And we have another podcast. It is a clip show. So basically the best of the best of Almost 30 comes out Monday through Friday and it's called Morning Microdose. It is a dose of inspiration from our show that you can start your day with. So five to 15 minutes, just a little dose to get you started on the right foot. Yeah, we love you guys. Thank you for being a part of our lives and community. Enjoy this one, share it with a friend and we'll see you on the other side. Bye. Taking care of your health isn't always easy, but it should at least be simple. That's why for the last, I think it's like four years now, I've been drinking AG1 every day. No exceptions. It's just one scoop mixed in water once a day, every day. And it makes me feel so good. It sets the foundation for my day. I notice that I have more energy, that I am mentally just more clear and sharp. Uh, I just feel ready to take on whatever. That's because each serving of AG1 delivers my daily dose of vitamins, minerals, pre and probiotics, and more. It's a powerful, healthy habit. So if you're looking for a powerful habit, that's also simple. This is for you. Um, why I love AG. Y'all, where do I begin? The ingredients in this simple scoop have been rigorously tested. They are just so obsessed with the quality of what goes in their powders. Um, So I love them for that. I'm also someone that's like just simplifying across the board. And so the fact that AG1 covers my bases with high quality ingredients like pre and probiotics, adaptogens, antioxidants, whole food sourced ingredients, I'm like... Frick, yes, <laughs> takes care of a lot in one scoop. So every morning I have my AG1. I put a scoop in some cold water. I like cold water, but do you I mix it up, take it down, and it's the first thing I put in my belly. So um, I just feel so much better. Uh, I definitely do it before any coffee. Honestly, some days it replaces my coffee. So if there's one product that I had to recommend to elevate your health, because I get that question, what's your health, number one health product? AG1 is definitely what I recommend. And that's why we've partnered with them for so long. So if you want to take ownership of your health, start with AG1. Try AG1 and get a free one-year supply of vitamin D3K2 and five free AG1 travel packs, my favorites. I bring them with me wherever I go with your first purchase exclusively at drinkag1.com slash almost 30. That's drinkag1.com slash almost 30 check it out. Okay. I used to be one of those people who thought they didn't have time to prioritize wellness. Like back in the day, I just thought, well, I have to go to work. I have to try and make it and reach my goals. And I have to like just the babble. Um, but I realized, (laughs) I realized that prioritizing my health and wellness actually helps me to do all of the other things so much better. And during the time when I was pregnant, I came across Aloe Moves. You've heard me talk about it. It is my fave. My whole mindset around just incorporating health, wellness, and movement has changed. It's become so much easier, so much more simple and fluid within my day. The app makes it easy to keep my wellness routine on track because they have everything in one place. There's yoga, there's Pilates, fitness classes, mindfulness, self-care tips, healthy recipes, and so much more. What's awesome is they have uh, classes for beginners to advanced. So anyone coming to this app will have classes for them and for their needs. Um, They have thousands of classes. So everything from yoga flows to hit to reformer Pilates, uh, workouts with weights, without weights. And I'm also loving their uh, tutorials and classes on meditation, affirmations, face yoga is my new jam. They do gua sha, dry brushing and journaling. Um, And it's just really enhanced my day and created for a much more dynamic wellness experience uh, as a new mom. So 
I'm really excited for you to unlock your personal wellness routine with Aloe Moves. Go to alomoves.com and use the code ALMOSTPOD for an exclusive 30-day free trial. Do it now. Do it now. Alomoves.com. Code is almost pod, almost pod, almost P O D, and enjoy 20% off an annual membership as well. So that's Alomoves, A L O M O V E S dot com. Code almost pod, A L M O S T P O D. Again, Alomoves.com. Code is almost pod. You went with a little gold ring, huh? Yeah. Classic. I like, I like the, I know, I actually never wore gold before. Yeah. I mean, when I was a teenager, I did. I was like, I went through a <laughs> I phase. I would pay money for that, to see like, photos of that. Like, <laughs> I would love to I see that. I don't know. In England, we have like, there's a whole culture of like oh. rough kids <laughs> wearing like gold chains yeah. and whatever. And I was like, Did you get your ears pierced? Not. No, no, no. I was just like gold bracelets <laughs> and gold chains and whatever. I was, yeah. Isn't that amazing? I was, I was, I had a, I, you know, I had a mixed family. We, we were like, <laughs> we, people, I can blend in quite well in America. People yeah. feel like I'm, I don't know what they think. I think they don't, they just don't realize like. Uh-huh. You I'm, do I actually. I come from urchins. <laughs> 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 they don't know here. I fly under the radar. You're like, I've been hiding it. People, it's like, um, Yeah. Like, uh, what is it? Great expectations where I've like been doled up and like yes. put on the top hat and come to America. <laughs> like, <laughs> and everyone's like, he was extremely posh back home. He must have been. He must have You're been. You're like, from... I grew from the ground. Yeah, yeah, no. <laughs> I come from urchins. Yeah. Um, I'm so grateful to have you. I'm so excited that you're here. Your content and your work supported me a lot after my divorce. Mm. So I was um, with my partner for like 10 years. We got a divorce um, after a year into marriage. And then it's been a year since. And it was just something that was so helpful um, as I navigate dating again. You know, it's been, I've really never been single in my life. I was like 15 when I had my first boyfriend and just was a series of relationships. So just finding your stuff was so helpful for me and inspiring for me. And what I love about you and the way that you present and deliver stuff is that you're very clear, but you're very kind. You're very loving. There's no judgment. There's like a perspective of gentleness, but also delivering really substantial thought. Like, I think you just do such an amazing job. And I think for a man to be speaking to so many women with such grace is like such a gift. So I just really admire you and your work. Wow. Well, I've, feel very seen firstly thank you i non-judgmental is i probably that's one of the phrases i'm most proud to be described mm. as actually because i i never want to be i you know god i've made so many mistakes and i feel like i've seen a lot of life and yeah. just i'm constantly humbled i think anytime you think you're you're like that's like, yeah. oh, other people do that. <laughs> You're like fated then to just screw up in that exact way yourself yeah. or to do even worse. And um, so I really appreciate that. And I'm really glad that what I do was there for you in that time. Mm-hmm. I, th- that to me is like one of the, I think I have a real soft spot for people going through it in that way. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, I, I don't know. I love, I love when people come up to me and they're like, I found love because of you, mm-hmm. but someone who's going through it mm-hmm. and being there for them in that time. Mm-hmm. In the trenches. Well, yeah. Well, the people that were there for me in times where I was going through it mm-hmm. are like, I'll never, I'll just never forget it. I'll yeah. never forget the voices that helped me through really, really dark times in my life. Mm -hmm. So I I think that's like a special bond that you can have with someone. Mm -hmm. And trauma bond. (laughs) Yeah, exactly. We've no trauma bond. bond. Parasocial positive trauma bond. The only good one. (laughs) Honestly. If it's with me. (laughs) (laughs) No, I I like yeah, that's a that's a lovely thing. Yeah. And I love, you know, you said the mistakes you've made and kind of your journey. And it's been beautiful in the book that I got to read some was just reading a like a more vulnerable side. You know, mm. it's I don't think you're never not vulnerable. There's never felt like there's anything hiding or you're not sharing anything. But it has felt like 
in the book, there was such a vulnerability that I was so refreshed to see and hear. And even at the beginning, just you talking about your experience in your 20s dating and not being the exact person that you would think should be teaching people. Or can you tell me more about that? Yeah. I, I mean, I started the book by, I suppose, trying very directly to take myself off of any yeah. kind of pedestal that anyone had ever put me on that, you know, I must've been a great guy to date, or I must've been a perfect guy to date, uh, because it certainly wasn't true. And I, I sort of hated, you know, I, I don't, I think that even hindered me in my love life, thinking that I was supposed to be, you know, like people were expecting me to be something or I, uh, I didn't They're want They're like that. using your tech scripts to you. <laughs> well, yeah, there's some <laughs> of that. Uh, but I would never really notice. I would never mm. remember if anyone was doing something because I just, the, you know, it, I remember some certain people saying, oh, that sounded like something you would say. And I was like, oh, I guess it was, <laughs> but it still, it worked. Totally. Um, yeah. Like I was like, well, it was good. <laughs> yeah, um, did you like it? <laughs> yeah. I liked it a lot. Um, no, but I, I was on my own path and mess and chaos trying to figure out how to be happy and and not always being very good at that I was lucky to find a sense of purpose early on in life in what I do for a living and you know I've been coaching people now for 17 years of my life and and that's been like an unbelievable gift in my life it's, it's provided for my family. It's given me huge fulfillment. It's been something that I've been able to lose myself in. Mm -hmm. It's kept me sane in hard times and dark times to be able to help other people. Mm -hmm. But when it came to my own love life, that was challenging because I knew how to create opportunities, but I wasn't I wasn't great at being happy. Mm -hmm. Like I, I, you know, I think like so many people, I had that experience of really never, never feeling satisfied, always feeling like I'm either chasing someone who's elusive and exciting, or I'm with someone that feels very safe, but I'm doubting whether they're the right person. And, you yeah. know, feeling broken in the process, like something is wrong with me. I've got friends who seem content. You know, they met yeah. someone at 25, settled down, they're happy. Why am I so hard to please? Like, what is going on with me? What's going on with the way I'm approaching this? And that was a that was kind of scary. And and when I wasn't when I wasn't getting myself into relationships and struggling to to be happy, which was never anyone else's fault, it was always my own. But when I wasn't doing that, I was sort of dating in a quite an addictive way where it was like, you know, chasing highs and the roller coaster of emotions and, um, and, and again, not being happy in the process and also not making anyone else happy either. So it, I was not, I was a confused person and confused people are, are dangerous people because mm -hmm. they, they, you know, you hurt people when you're confused and when you don't know how to make yourself happy, you certainly don't know how to help someone else be happy. Yeah. So yeah, I think for a long time I was, I was trying to figure my way out through that at the same time as not wanting to necessarily look like I was trying to figure out my way through that because, you know, I, it, it didn't, you know, I didn't, it didn't resonate with the version of me that I was putting out there, which was never one. I mean, I don't think anyone would have looked at my work over 17 years. It doesn't matter when you joined me and thought I was in any way being like, I'm so great. I'm so, per I was never doing that. But, you know, I did feel the pressure to have that area of my life kind of figured out. And, the, you know, these things grow in interesting ways. Because when I started out, it was always... I was someone who was both shy and introverted growing up. So I had to figure out how to create opportunities myself. And a lot of like people skills and everything initially served me in being a little braver and being a little more extroverted when I needed to be. And all of that was great. And that ended up being very teachable stuff that I was like, oh, wow, like I've, I've learned how to get myself out there more. 
I've learned how to not just go through life being chosen, but actually being able to like meet people I want to meet. And I can show you how to do that too. And that was, that was like where my journey started with women was helping them to be pro more proactive so that they had more choice. And because I had this idea in my head that if women had more choice, they'd make better decisions about who to give their time and energy to. I was half right <laughs> and half, maybe 60 to 70% wrong actually. But, you know, at a certain point, you know, when you're 25, everyone's like, you know, he's the guy that helps you, you know, go out and find love mm -hmm. and create opportunity and make things happen. And I was, I was, mm -hmm. I was that. But, you know, at a certain point, people start going, why aren't you, <laughs> you in like, a look relationship? Over here. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Let me give you more opportunities. Yeah, and it's like, look at my whiteboard. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, let me give you more There's opportunities. 10 more guys. Be uh, so that was, uh, that was my, that was kind of a, a, that was not good for me or it was, wasn't easy for me because I, I felt like the, I felt like the person I was coaching who yeah. was sat telling me how she was sat at the Thanksgiving table, feeling pressure from her family. Mm -hmm. Like, why, why are you not in a relationship? And I was like, I feel like that, but you know, I've got a hundred thousand people asking me the question every year. Like that was a crazy, mm -hmm. that's a crazy amount of pressure to mm -hmm. feel. And I, what I didn't want to do is feel kind of allow that pressure to have me make a bad decision because that was that would have been very easy to do and the one thing amidst many many mistakes in my love life and many regrets the thing that I'm proud of is that I didn't I didn't just you know yeah. try and slip into something and stay there because I was afraid of that pressure I mean imagine the prison you know, that you'd be in because oh then God. it would be like, like imagine if it wasn't Audrey and you mm -hmm. guys didn't have this beautiful relationship that you truly genuinely worked for. Like then it would be like the couple. You, and then it would be like, oh, now he's going to break up. Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. and that's, I, I think people realize, but I don't think people realize like being someone like you to have that type of pressure is just so hard. Yeah, it's not great. But then I have no sympathy for myself either mm -hmm. because it's, it. you're right. And- why did I choose to do this? Well, you were like a child. Yeah, I was a child. <laughs> I could, at some point, I could have taken a left turn. <laughs> yeah, and gone, like, yo, do you know what? I'm going to create a, you know, start a pizza shop. <laughs> I, I, start an app. I think that we, you know, we kind of do it to ourselves a bit. But I did, I always remember, I always remember like looking up to Tony Robbins at a very young age and going, I simultaneously looked up to him and mm -hmm. also went, I can't do that. I can't, the, the, the standard that he has set for himself is so impossibly high that I can't live like that. Yeah. I, I want people to be disappointed by me. I want people to, you know, I, I don't want the, it's why, you know, it was like the, even though I kind of took myself off the pedestal in this book, I kind of have been doing that the whole mm -hmm. way through. I trying to make sure no one mm -hmm. like thought of me as someone who like it, it, has it all figured out, has their diet figured out and has this figured out mm -hmm. and that figured out and like just the everything mm -hmm. boy or I just couldn't stand the idea mm -hmm. that I couldn't screw up probably because <laughs> I was I've screwed up a lot in my life. And I was like, I don't want there to be a yeah. big disconnect between, I always want people to, someone to meet me on the street and go, that makes sense. 100%. That's my biggest nightmare is for someone to be like, she's different. That's yeah. not what I, cause you've seen it in our industry, in our world and our work. I see it a lot. And it's like, when there is a big disconnect, I'm like, oh, it breaks my heart. Mm -hmm. Cause I'm like, oh, that's, yeah. Horrible fit is a, horrible. That, that's another kind of prison. And it's, oh man, that one's a scary one. Mm -hmm. When, when the person we portray is just very different from our natural state of being. Mm -hmm. Yeah, And it's exhausting, you know, exhausting makes it really hard to grow because yeah. you can't really, you know, you want to grow with support. You don't want to have to grow in private all the time away from support to try to catch up to some idea that people have of you that, yes. you know, that's a horrible yes. way to live. Yeah. I think what's been beautiful too, is not only <clears throat> the vulnerability you shared in the book, but seeing your journey with your wife and just seeing how she's involved in content more. She's adding her perspective. She has her insights. And 
I'm curious for someone that's been in this space for so long, like now having her perspective and having her join the team and how has that changed how you view things Mm -hmm. and how has that changed yeah, the way that you the way that you navigate your work. She's so firstly, she's brilliant. Like yeah. brilliant. She has an amazing mind. And her content, like when I speak mm-hmm. to her about things, she just will say things and I'll be like, Oh God, that's so good. Mm-hmm. Like I'm angry I didn't come up with that. <laughs> like, yeah. You know? Like, like that like, pisses me off. Yeah, that was really good. And it's she's just she's like got a preternatural ability with this stuff and with helping you know like i've i've had 17 years of practice at crafting Mm -hmm. the ideas and speaking them but she's just raw ability that just needs to be channeled Mm -hmm. and it's so interesting because we now in we have our love life club that we coach people every month and you would you know she she's in there helping people and talking you know she's like drawing a whole crowd of her own and talking to people and she people it, she has no right to be as liked as she is already. Like within a few years, it's just astonishing. But it, mm-hmm. but it's because she's that good. Um, I how has thing how has it changed? I've empathy has always been a superpower for me. But like, she makes me look like Gordon Ramsay. <laughs> <laughs> like she, she she's so sweet. an empathy machine, mm-hmm. and so. I used to feel like I was the one in the room who really <laughs> y- had the compassionate mm-hmm. response. You're like, tear, zoom in. <laughs> uh, yeah. And then she'll step in and she'll <laughs> say something and I'll be like, I'm a real piece of shit yeah. for not saying that. Yeah. <laughs> like she really <laughs> empathized with that person. Yeah, you're like, ah. <laughs> no, I, I think she's brought this whole other level of compassion and kindness and and empathy and, you know, understanding of women yeah. you know my understanding of women i've spent you know by the time i'd met audrey i'd spent 14 years around women non-stop yeah. mm-hmm. doing what i do and yet she came along and challenged me in new ways and deep you know i feel like i came out of a crash course where i went oh i just and now i understand women even better and it's like a it is very humbling um mm-hmm. and so i know i just is it's been so much fun. It's she's she's made everything better, and it's so much fun to do it mm-hmm. together. Yeah, it's yeah. beautiful. Like, yeah, she just adds like a layer that's just so nice. I mean, you didn't need it, but just having her in there is so beautiful. Um, one of the topics in the book that I really love that it's curious. I'm curious what your perspective is on it because I think self love needs a rebrand too. But I'm curious at what angle you come at it. Like, why do you believe that self love needs a rebrand? I don't. I, I've never found a lot of the stuff on self-love helpful. Um, I, I didn't relate to it at the very least. It, it didn't. I'm a very logical, probably high, maybe too rational, like person. I, I can't just take giant leaps of faith in things. I don't. I can't just believe something because I want it to be true. Mm-hmm. Some people seem to have that gift mm-hmm. and I just don't. My I, whole audience. <laughs> right. And, and, and like iconic at that. <laughs> <laughs> I can't, I can't do it. I, yes. I don't, it just has always been impossible for me. And when it came to self-love, I think maybe it fell into that bracket a little bit mm-hmm. of what does that mean and how do you do it? how is that achieved? It can't be at candles and a bubble bath. Mm-hmm. Like it does, you know, mm-hmm. it, I don't know what that is, you know, it's okay. Self-care. I'm loving myself. I me, I'm sitting in the bath after half an hour. I'm like, I, <laughs> you're like, I've already ate the ice cream. Yeah, I've yeah. had the chocolate. <laughs> yeah. I think people confuse self-love with self-care. Right. But even when you say to people, I agree with that. Mm-hmm. But when I would say to audiences, why should you love yourself? Most audiences were stumped. I would stand on stage every year at my retreat and I'd be like, why should you love yourself? Because we all agree self-love is really important, right? People would be like, mm-hmm. yes. I'd be like, yeah, we're said everywhere all the time. Mm-hmm. Self-love is really important. They're like, it's on my shirt. Right. <laughs> but why? Why should you love yourself? And after a few seconds of silence, people would be like, well, because I, we deserve it. And I'd be like, okay, but what is that? 
there's, there's just another aphorism. Why do you deserve it? Mm-hmm. And they go, well, because I'm kind. And then they go, oh, because I'm generous, because I take care of my family, because I work hard. Because, And I'd be like, but that's, there's a problem with all of that, which is that you're really just giving yourself an A on your good days and telling yourself I'm lovable because I'm all these good things. Well, what do you do when you're selfish? What do you do when you hurt someone? What do you do when you are mean or you act in your own interest and not somebody else's? Mm -hmm. Like what, do you not deserve love on those days? And then people would be stumped again because they'd realize they were doing the adult, even though it felt deep, like I'm giving myself love for all these deep qualities I have. It was like the adult equivalent of giving a child a, a love because they got good grades. Not to mention even on your best days, Someone can walk into the room at any time and be more of those things that you think you make you worthy of love. And they do. There are people that are more intelligent. There are people who are more loving, more generous, do more for their family or their community, people who work harder. So if that's the case, are you less lovable than they are? And people will be like, no, that can't be it. Okay. So it's not qualities. So why should you love yourself? And then someone will be like, well, because we're special. <laughs> and I'd be like... <laughs> Well, why? Like, what do you mean we're special? Are we all special? And They're like, this say, exercise is enough. We want to stop. <laughs> but, I, but I loved it because I was like, yeah. it, for me, I was only articulating the inner dialogue that I was having with myself yeah. mm-hmm. and being like, let me put pressure on your arguments. Because if you can't give me a good reason for any of this, you're not going to love yourself either. Mm-hmm. So this needs to be bulletproof. And right now, none of the answers you're giving me are bulletproof. Mm-hmm. You say we're special. Aren't we all special? Yeah, we are all special. Then, well, then none of us are special, mm-hmm. right? We're just one in 8 billion. Mm-hmm. And by the way, even if I keep telling myself I'm special, it, when someone better looking, taller, more successful, has an easier time achieving because of how smart they are, whatever walks into the room, it certainly feels like their brand of special was really great, mm-hmm. <laughs> right? Yes. Like it, we all feel that people go on dating apps and they're like, yeah, okay, I'm special, but I still am invisible and not getting any, I'm, oh, no, I'm not getting any, any matches. So can I be their version of special? <laughs> it, so it's still a problem. So I started saying, okay, what, what is broken about all of this? And I realized it's all trying to love ourselves using the romantic model for love. Mm. The, the way that we fall in love with someone else. We fall in love with someone else because they have great qualities. And if they're, you know, we either fall in love with them based on very superficial qualities or we're deep people. So we fall in love with their deep qualities. Mm. Either way, it's still someone we think is awesome. And the mystery of uncovering them and learning about them makes them feel even more awesome and makes us want to really get to know them and want to, you know, it's the, it's, it's that idea of, you know, Esther Perel talks about of desire being the precursor to love. And when we desire someone, we fall in love with them and we start to want to become one with that person. Now, of course, if you do that too much, Mm -hmm. the other side of the coin is, familiarity breeds contempt and polarity. So now you have long-term couples who are sick of each other, who take each other for granted. They no longer see all the great things they bring to the table and they're magnifying all of the bad things they bring to the table and have contempt for their partner and it breaks down. Now, if you take that, so if you take that phrase, familiarity breeds contempt, that tells you everything you need to know about why it's hard to love ourselves. Mm. because who would we have more familiarity with than the person we have woken up with every morning our entire lives? It's a good one. So if familiarity breeds contempt, when it comes to ourselves, what other emotion is there even space for? (laughs) So most people have so much self-contempt because they've forgotten everything that's great about themselves and they've magnified everything they've ever done that's bad or shitty or wrong or whatever all of their, in, in, in the ways they're uh, uh, deficient. So this is what I mean when I say self-love needs a rebrand. The romantic model is broken. We need a new model. What's the new model? Well, I started looking at the parent-child relationship and saying there's this other model for love that seems really, really ubiquitous 
that might give us a clue as to how to love ourselves. If you ask a parent, why do you love your child? They don't say because she got an A in mm-hmm. math last mm-hmm. week, because she did this really cute thing this morning. She looked so good in her dress. <laughs> like they don't say that. They say, I, I, what do you mean? They're my child. They're mine. It's obvious to them, but they also don't need to give a reason. The only reason, the only one that matters is they're my child. So that to me left a clue. And that clue can be found in other kinds of relationships. If you take a child with a stuffed toy and try and take that stuffed toy away and give them a more expensive stuffed toy, they'll be like, what are you doing? I don't want the more expensive one. I want my stuffed toy. If you take people with their pets, there are some ugly dogs. You walk down the street and there's dogs with no teeth mm-hmm. and no fur and they're just t- tongues hanging out to the yeah. left and they're just like weird little things. <laughs> if you said to that dog owner, I've got this beautiful pedigree dog to exchange for your dog, they'd be like, what are you talking about? This is my dog. That's so true. Mm-hmm. So I looked at all that language and said, how does that apply to our relationship with ourselves? Well, we are one in eight billion So we're never going to, I don't believe I'm ever really going to win the battle of feeling special Mm -hmm. for all of my qualities in that 8 billion. And by the way, even if I do temporarily, it's an ego battle that I've won and it's, I'm days or months or years away from someone coming along that makes me Mm -hmm. go, I suck. Yeah. (laughs) Like I, I'm not as good as I, Mm -hmm. they're amazing. So I'm going to lose at some point. What's a way to feel that I'm special that has nothing to do with that and is bulletproof? Well, of those 8 billion people, there's only one person who has responsibility for the human that is me. Only one. It's like at birth, we were each given a human and Someone just whispered to us, by the way, your job for the rest of your life is just take care of this one human. That's all you have to do. You don't have to do anything else. Just take care of this human. Mm. And of course, for the first few years of our lives, someone else had the job of helping us survive. But at a certain point, it was no longer their job. It was our job. We then took full custody for this human being. And our job was to protect this human, encourage this human, support this human, stand up for this human, give this human the best life you can, help them realize their potential and help them have the best time they can. When you look at life through that lens, comparison makes no sense anymore because you can't exchange your human for another human. You just get this one human and your job is to give that human the best life possible. That changed the game for me in terms of self-love because I realized what's special is not me. What's special is the relationship I have with this human because I'm the only one that has this relationship with this human, no one else. So for me then, anytime I'm like treating myself poorly, I'm facing burnout, Mm -hmm. I'm not taking care of myself, I think to myself, you had one job. Mm -hmm. where have you been? Like you left your post, take care of this human was the mandate and you're not doing that. That, that is the game changer. And what it makes you realize, by the way, is that you don't, most people struggle. They're like, I can't love myself. I don't even like myself. Yeah. What this rebrand allows you to do is realize you don't actually need to like yourself to love yourself. Mm -hmm. Loving yourself is your job. Loving yourself is an approach. It's not a feeling. Mm -hmm. It's an approach. It's a verb. It's an action you take today Mm -hmm. and every other day. And you may not like yourself for a long time. The same way a kid, a parent does all these amazing Mm -hmm. things for a kid. There's no guarantee that kid's going to recognize all those things that the parent's doing for a long time. Mm -hmm. They may get to adulthood and suddenly like start realizing, oh my God, my parent did so many things Mm -hmm. for me. But, and the relationship grows sweeter with every realization. Mm -hmm. But in the beginning, that may not happen. And you can't expect that to happen with your relationship with yourself either. 
you don't have to like yourself today, mm. but you do have to love yourself because you're the only one who has that job. Mm. The cavalry is not coming. It is you. Mm. You are the cavalry. So that's how, that's the rebrand that I believe self-love needs. And I think it makes it in, from this Instagram yeah. platitude yeah. into something that is everyone can relate to and go, I know how to start doing that mm -hmm. today. It's kind of like the inner child, like taking care of the inner child a little bit, or I really love it because it's not um, based on you achieving anything, you doing anything. It's like, cause that's for me, self-love is loving all parts. And that's even the parts that are shameful, the parts that are guilty. Like when I'm not mm -hmm. feeling well, it's like, it's not even like, I actually don't even look at all the good things of myself. Cause that's easy for me to love. It's like, what are the worst things about me? What are the worst things about my experience when I want to abandon myself or shame myself or guilt myself? How can I just love myself through that experience? So I really love that. And I think it's beautiful for people to think about it in that way of like, that's, I just love the perspective of like, of course I love myself. Like that, that parent, Part. I literally imagine, it's, it's like <laughs> everyone out there listening to this right now, imagine someone saying to you, why do you love yourself? And you, the same way a parent would love scoff that. at the question, you scoff at the question and you're like, what are you talking? Because I'm mine. I'm, yeah. I'm my human. Mm, I love that. That quote, I'm mine before anyone else's. I forget mm. who that is. It's really beautiful. Um, but in the book too. So another one of the pillars is the self-love piece, which I really loved. And it's also about standards. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and I want to talk about standards because I always like, I don't struggle, but I'm always just curious of the nuance of things. It's like, okay, so, you know, everyone's like, okay, put standards up. And then sometimes it's, I feel like, and I perceive this and you can correct me if I'm wrong. People have standards that eventually serve as walls where they're like, are they too high? Are they too specific? Like, what is the boundaries and rules we should have around standards? Can your standards be too high? Can they be unrealistic? Could it be something that's keeping you from actual genuine connection because you're looking for like a prince on the other side of the world that's mm -hmm. going to be these things? Like, tell me more about how you see standards. So I think there's two ways of looking at this. One is that we have really high standards about a lot of things that don't matter. And we have really low standards about the things that matter immensely. And I see that all the time. People who proclaim to have really high standards will routinely chase people who treat them like crap. Which that is, is so powerful. Really like a weird blind spot. Yes. Is it, the way they have standards is very a la carte. It's not like this holistic, I have really high standards. It's like, no, no, no. You have really high standards for how tall someone is. And when it comes to like someone being kind, you seem not to care at all that this person Good. is an asshole. Mm -hmm. Like, how is that high <laughs> standards? It, it, so there's that way of looking at standards. It's so real. And the other way of looking at standards is I think people don't, they have pretty low standards for the way that they show up and sculpt something with someone. Mm. In, in other words, I'm a, I'm a big believer in this idea of settle. None of us want to settle in life. We see it as a very negative word. And that's because at our core, none of us want to be shortchanged. So we want to get the best possible person we think we can get. So we say, I don't want to settle for someone, but I think settling is a word that can be changed just by adding a, a different word on the end of it. So if instead of settling for someone, you settle on someone, mm. settling on is a very powerful phrase. It implies agency. It imbues your choice with all of the weight of you having made the decision to go for that thing when you had other options. And by deciding you're committing to making that thing the best it can be and nothing, you don't know how good anything is until you settle on it. That's true of every, that's like a, just a life principle that works across the board. Why are so many people unhappy in their careers or as serial entrepreneurs who can never sit still. It's because instead of 
actually sitting with something and going, I'm going to settle on this thing and make it the best I can make it. They are expecting it to be a certain amount of amazing on day one. And it doesn't work like that. It's you, you didn't, yeah. in your career, you didn't start by it all presenting itself to you in exactly the way you wanted it to. You, you got a feeling probably, and you kind of went in a direction and there were parts of it that fell off along the way because you're like, I don't really enjoy that as much as I thought I would. Like, I don't want to do merch anymore. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. Like, like, no more merch. That wasn't it. <laughs> yeah, no. <laughs> you know, but but within there, you ended up sculpting it into something that just gets better every year because you get closer and closer to this amazing dream scenario. And because of the effort you can you keep putting into it, it keeps getting better that's settling on something. The commitment comes from settling on it. And that work that then goes into it has the potential to make that thing really great. So I don't think people have high enough standards for their own commitment to something. They're expecting something to be a certain amount of amazing on day one. And the things that often present themselves as the most amazing on day one are the most dangerous things. They're the most seductive. They're the people that like, have you ever had someone you met and you were just from the moment you met, like the day you met them, you were like, this person's amazing. And yes. you were like, we're going to be best friends. And yes. you just were so charmed by them. Yes. And then three months later, you look back and you're like, what was I thinking? I know. Think, I'm not even talking about romantic. I know. Just friendships, people yeah. that you come into your life and like something about them mm -hmm just like let me up it got yes. you and you're like i this person's you you, you like go home and you're like i feel like you <laughs> yeah. i'm in love with like this I miss person you already. yeah yeah yes. yeah and and sometimes that leads to something but other times in friendships you look back on those and you're like wow that person had a lot of impact mm -hmm. there was something they were really had a certain way of communicating, a certain way of presenting mm -hmm. themselves, a certain way of asking questions that was, it pushed all my buttons. But actually when it came down to it, that person had none of the character mm -hmm. that is really important to me. That person wasn't a friend. I mean, they I literally never heard from them again. I, they, or when I was in a time in my life where I was going through a hard time, that person wasn't even, there was nowhere to be seen. Or you catch them like you're in a room and you catch them like immediately just switch their attention to someone else yeah. and go in and do And you're like, oh my God, this yeah. is like a, this laser beam that they have that they just shine for maximum impact, but it has nothing to do with their core or who they are. That's, we should remember those moments mm -hmm. because they're a great signal that the things that can feel the most amazing on day one are, are often the things that get us in the most trouble. Mm. Um, so I, I think it's worth us all exploring where are the places I, my standards are too high about things that don't matter. Where are my standards too low about things that really do matter? And where am I expecting my dream job on day one or my dream yeah. partner on day one, mm. instead of realizing that dream relationships are sculpted, yes. dream careers are sculpted. That's like dream bodies are sculpted. Dream bodies are sculpted. <laughs> that's for sure. <laughs> uh, this during this whole book launch period, my, my I'm going the opposite direction. <laughs> You're like the more I'm seen in public, the worse I feel. But how really I look. unsculpting my body <laughs> yeah, right now. Like... One thing I learned about myself was that being in the public eye does not make me more vain. I like really. I did a TV show when I first came to Los Angeles, uh -huh. and as, I, you, as you do. It was a really big show. And I remember thinking to myself, this is going to be the time where I really like <laughs> yes, get in the yes. best shape of my life. Yep. It did not move me. I, could, I remember being in LA for the first time and all the other talent on the show were like in the hotel gym all the time. And I was just like <laughs> in my room ordering pizza. Yeah. And I remember thinking I've either I'm broken <laughs> Or I'm not nearly as vain as I thought I was. <laughs> <Yeah>, 100%. <laughs> There's limits. Sometimes, well, it's like I, in that case, I'd be like, they're all going to win anyway, so I'm just going to go the other way. Mm, you know, I, they're mm. all going to be. 
Right, yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, yeah. You've been doing this for six months before yes. you even got to the hotel yeah. gym. This work didn't start when you <laughs> yes. got to the... I'm like, I'm going to make my the way I look my unique quality. Yeah, <laughs> you know yeah, what I mean? Yeah. This is going to be my defining factor. I recently talked about this on Instagram. I am taking more of a holistic approach when it comes to aging, skincare. Um, I, in my late 20s, did a bit of Botox in my forehead and uh, along the like crow's feet lines. And not that I regret it, but I am in an era, I'm in my motherhood era. I am still breastfeeding. Um, I potentially want to get pregnant eventually again. And I just will not be doing Botox anytime soon. And so I have taken another route. And one of the incredible products that I'm using right now is called Biosil. <sighs> okay, they have been in the game forever. Uh, it's a premium product that helps you generate your own collagen. Why is collagen important? It's important for your skin. It gives natural support and firmness to your face. Not sure if you know this, but after the age of 21, you start losing 1% of your collagen every year. Do the math. So this helps to generate your own collagen and also helps you protect the collagen you already have. This product is backed by science over 25 years and $25 million in research. It is clinically proven to work for healthier hair, skin, and nails. I have seen an incredible difference over the last six weeks that I've been using it. I've noticed the fine lines and wrinkles in my forehead um, have really reduced. I'm very impressed and very excited. So I'm going to keep it going. I take one little capsule in the morning and one little capsule at night. It's so easy. They're tiny. Um, and I'm just seeing the results. So this product has a uh, again, is clinically proven. It increases skin elasticity by 89% and decreases the appearance of fine lines and wrinkles by 30%. Pretty freaking amazing. Again, this is safe for pregnant moms-to-be or when breastfeeding. You can buy it online on Biosil's website, which we recommend, biosil.beauty or your local retailer. So if you're already taking collagen like me, I know a supplement that actually works great as an addition to pair with your existing collagen intake. Um, if you're not feeling comfortable taking animal derived collagen, this is for you too. If you want to get started uh, with your own collagen production, this is an offer for our listeners who get 30% off your first subscription order with a code almost 30. Let me break that down for you. Go to biosil.beauty. Use the code ALMOST30 at checkout to get 30% off your first product order on Biosilb's website. You will love it. I'm so excited for you. Send me your results. DM me on Instagram. I want to know how this is working for you. So excited. Biosilb.beauty. Code is ALMOST30. Something that I really love is my sweet cats, Fuji and Ugi. They are so meaningful to me. And I know if you love your animals too, that your pet is one of a kind. So is their journey in life. So while every playful moment is a memory in the making, sometimes our cats and dogs are a little too good at getting into trouble. That's why you should check out ASPCA Pet Health Insurance. The ASPCA Pet Health Insurance Program offers customizable accident and illness plans, making it easier for pet parents like you to help get you the pet care that they may need. The SPCA Health Insurance Program has been around for over 18 years, and they've helped more than 600,000 pets during that time. It allows you to customize your plan, helping ensure that your pet's plan is as unique as they are, because vet bills can really add up, especially when you're least expecting it. It's actually really simple. So you can use their app to submit a claim, and you'll receive reimbursement for eligible vet bills directly into your bank account. To explore coverage, visit ASPCAPetInsurance.com slash almost 30. That's ASPCAPetInsurance.com slash almost 30. Again, that's ASPCAPetInsurance.com slash almost 30. That's almost three zero. This is a paid advertisement. Insurance is underwritten by either Independence American Insurance Company or United States Fire Insurance Company and produced by PTZ Insurance Agency Limited. The SPCA is not an insurer and not engaged in the business of insurance. Something you said when you were speaking about this situation in self-love, if we were to come back around to it. And something I'm curious about, and I noodle on this a lot, and you, I know you've talked about it before, but is the chemistry conversation. Mm -hmm. So, because when you find that person, you're like, this is it. They light up and they look everything. There's a part of me that I, if I could inject chemistry in my veins every day, I would. I love that feeling of chemistry, connection, da, 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 da. It's the best. The best ever. But where is it, where is it a red flag? Where is it not? Like, what are your feelings on that? Well, it's a, definitely a red flag if you feel more chemistry as someone starts to pull away. 
Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like if if someone's the not, fantasies really kick in when they start to pull away. <laughs> if if they yeah exactly, and if they if them not texting you back for the last two days has really made you realize you like them, something is wrong there. Yeah. That's a good one. The, your nervous system has become activated. Mm-hmm. It's not that you have so much chemistry with this person. It's that there's something about this situation that has you activated. Mm-hmm. Maybe at some point in your life you learned that love is elusive or that love mm-hmm. has to be earned or that love is hot and cold. And so someone making you feel unsure of yourself and they were there last week and now they're not. And then all of a sudden... Four days later, they send you a text and say, what are you up to? And you go, they are thinking of me. Oh, my God, I really do like this person. I'm like, like, ladies, the night's off. I'll see you later. (laughs) Yeah, exactly. (laughs) I'm like letting all the group chats know. I'm like, we're good. (laughs) And you have to ask yourself, in that situation, what did they do? What, What happened that was material that made you think you had chemistry with them? Mm -hmm. It's not like they didn't like, they weren't a bird that like started fanning its things and doing a little <laughs> dance and like hopping around and you go, that was the greatest dance yeah. I've ever seen. That was so sexy. I feel more chemistry now than I did at the beginning. Like, wow. It's that they literally s- didn't send you a message and then sent you a message. And the juxtaposition be- between the anxiety you felt and the relief you felt feels like chemistry. And so hmm. I think those things are red flags for sure. So um, I just want to say that again. So the juxtaposition between the anxiety and the relief you felt is a lot of the chemistry. I think that's We mistake huge. that feeling for chemistry. Wow. And so, and because anything that feels like that can feel yeah. like chemistry, right? It's a, it's a yes. drug. It's a release. It's highs. It's lows. Yeah. It's, it, it simulates something that it's not. Yeah. So I think that's really important to acknowledge. Um, I think we have to be really careful of comparison shopping for chemistry, like looking for someone to match the height of a chemistry we felt in the past, because that's a really common mistake. And very often the chemistry we've felt in the past was it's really unfair to compare someone to it because it was a chemistry born out of a very specific set of circumstances. You're on vacation. You're in Hawaii. You know, like, yes, 100%. And and you're leaving. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You're leaving. Of course Mm -hmm. it feels exciting. You're not going to have it in five days. It's, you, you know, like fireworks are often used to describe chemistry, right? Let's think of actual literal fireworks. When we look up at fireworks, they're amazing. We get starry eyed and we look at our people we're with and we're like, oh my God, these are so cool. Look at the beautiful, oh my God. In order for fireworks to be awesome, what has to happen? Explosions. (laughs) Yeah. No, you're right. Okay. Is that an answer? When people ask me this stuff, it's, who knows what's going to come out. Well, let me tell you the key condition of fireworks being awesome. Okay. They have to end. Okay. 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 <laughs> if fireworks lasted two hours, none of us would think they were awesome anymore. It's true. We would be after We'd be annoyed. 20 minutes. You'd be like, yeah. Okay. But when it's 15 minutes of like craziness, mm-hmm. even then by the end, but <laughs> like minute five, you're like, I know this is going to end soon. We yeah. have to enjoy this. There's something about that that produces the effect. Mm-hmm. And when you take the chemistry we often compare someone today to who's like healthy and they're actually turning around to meet us and they're being simple and they're just saying, I'd like to see you again. And it, everything about it feels peaceful and it feels sustainable. It's, we then compare that to this situation, this three month fling that we had where at the end of that three month fling, the person was like, ah, I just, I know I have something so special with you, but I really want to travel. And you're like, okay, that person will come to me and be like, they're the one. Mm -hmm. You don't understand. Like this person, I've never felt a connection like that in my life. It was incredible. And I'm like, yeah, but whenever anyone says they're the one, I'm like, but it ended. Mm -hmm. (laughs) It ended. Like this person didn't have to pass a very high bar. (laughs) Because you, you, you never got to find out who they are in month six. Mm-hmm. 
or what it felt like in year three. You never got that far. So now this has been frozen at this impossible high that every normal relationship you ever compare it to is not being compared to what that would have been like if it became normal. Mm -hmm. It's being compared to this thing at its peak. And how can anyone, how can anyone ever compete with Jack on the Titanic? <laughs> Impossible. I know, so true. How can anyone compete and with he, Jack on the Titanic? he gave up his life. Yeah, and he only had to be great for like five days. So true. <laughs> so true. <laughs> it, we don't That's know who Jack so was true. on like month six. It's, it, it, and you... This some I love Titanic makes me cry every time. It's I rewatched it recently. Movie. Jack is so little. Yeah, my wife Audrey said that as well. She's no like, he's way. a baby. Yeah, same. He's a baby. He's a baby. But like, I get it. Every time I watch it, I'm like, I so get why everyone fell in love with this. Mm -hmm. And I and it's an amazing movie. And I'm not taking away from that. I love romantic movies. But if you step back from the movie element mm -hmm. of it and you say, so just hang on a second. <laughs> We have a woman who is like a hundred years old. <laughs> oh yes, who's still sort of a little bit like caught up on a guy she met on a boat for five days. <laughs> I mean, granted, it was very heroic how he went, but like, this is this is a like a, <laughs> grandma. You need help. It's a lot of story. <laughs> and grandma was married. Yeah. <laughs> you know how annoyed I would be if I was the husband? 100% like Jack again. Like every time they my fight. Life, yeah, literally. My actual whole yes, life. Yes, yes. A living life. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes, yes, I was yes. here for 40 years. <laughs> and you're still thinking about the guy on the bike. Yeah, literally. Every time they fight, she's like, well, Jack would have. He's like, oh. <laughs> Jack wouldn't have done this. Yeah, honestly. <laughs> <laughs> Wait, that's insane. Yeah. No, I, there's something to that because we all, we nurture these, like, I, I call them the unhatched eggs of our love life. Dude. Like these things that we nestle and we go, oh, but if it ever hatched, this is what it would be. But we're never proven wrong because it never hatches. And those stories occupy our life if we're not careful. So a, a part of like, wow. a part of being happy in our love lives, I believe, is a, this is going to sound so weird in some ways, but a commitment to living a real life. No, that's a, huge. A commitment to being active and, and an, an active and involved participant in our actual life instead of holding on to the comfort of, of the story in our mind, which is very safe. The stories mm -hmm. keep us safe because you can enjoy a story of, of mm -hmm. what could have been from your bedroom. You don't have to go out and you don't have to get rejected and you don't have to be with a real person, a real human being. And real human beings are often wildly disappointing. And it's like, you don't, you don't have to do that. You don't have to meet the frontier between you and another real person and all of the tension and all of the th real things that come with that. You can just stay home and nest this warm little mm -hmm. unhatched egg that is only kept warm by your imagination, mm -hmm. not because anything is actually happening with it. And that's the, that's, that's the danger. And I see that all the time. So that, that to me is like the answer on chemistry is, yeah. do I think chemistry is important? A hundred percent. Do I think sexual attraction is important? Of course. Yeah. It's going to be a very long relationship if you don't have those mm -hmm. things, but stop comparing people that you meet today to some artificial peak of someone who never actually even had to prove that they were there long term or sustain that because it never would have been sustained in that way long term um and understand that there are that sexual attraction is much more interesting than you just see someone on an app and you feel something. It's not like that. Mm -hmm. It's a weird, it's like, why do people fall in love a lot at work? It, you, you kind of yeah. have a bit more time. Yes. You, you see someone, like you might have known someone for a month or two and then they do some funny little thing mm -hmm. and you're like, uh oh, what was that I just felt? Mm -hmm. Or they show up at like the event wearing an outfit you didn't mm -hmm. think they could pull up and you're like, oh, that's, I didn't see you like that before. Yeah. There's some little thing they do. There's a way they tease you on week three. Yeah. Like it's, and, and it, 
starts to change the way you see them and you realize. We call every- that the ick, Matthew. Well, no, I'm talking about in a positive sense, <laughs> okay. not in but, a bad okay. sense. No, good ick. No, no. like, like that moment oh, where you oh, realize yes. like you actually see them as sexy yes. or you see them where before you didn't yes. see them as more than that. You see them engaging with their friends or doing something where they're in their power or in their exactly. moment or they have cash in their back pocket. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, right, yeah. Right. Um, <laughs> no, but you, you surprise yourself. Who hasn't been surprised at someone they got attracted to that wasn't their type? Mm. Who hasn't had that moment where they're like, this is so like strange for me. I, I never normally would pick out this kind of person, but like I feel a lot of like sexual mm. tension with them. But how many of those people do we disqualify on apps mm. every day before even reaching the point where we see if there's chemistry? So my thing is, it's not that chemistry is not important. It's that our barriers, our, our like entry to chemistry is just too tight where we can never actually... For a lot of people, we never get to the point of realizing we could have chemistry with them. Mm. Wow. That was a whole journey. That was profound. Um, and the moral of the story is if they have money your- in their <laughs> back pocket. They're a winner. <laughs> hey, everybody, find a man with cash in his pocket. <laughs> I just love like when a man has cash in his wallet and he's like, let me just pay that for that in cash. Doesn't it's not doesn't mean he has to be rich. I just love like that can do attitude of cash. There's this is there's a weird thing that's happened in my past. No, I problem. think I, I have this old fashioned thing where I'm like, you can't be a man and not carry some cash around. But, I do have that in the, my head because it's like almost a survival thing. Thank you. Like you need, you know, it's like having a pen knife. Yeah. You just it some what would you do if you were in a situation where cards couldn't work? Yep. You can't be the person who says, I don't have cash yep. like that i i have that image in my head of like yes. a, a, a man yeah. <laughs> a man carries cash <laughs> <laughs> this is my man he has cash yeah. no it's also too like he's tipping people right yeah stripper i've got that um okay something this is kind of a random one but i'm curious of your thoughts um because i feel like it's a conversation so many women i see having and so many women that i know see having and it's when you're, they're dating a man or they're in a, you know, in the process of dating them. And they'll often say, you're intimidating him or he's intimidated by you. And then if something ends, they'll often be like, well, maybe he liked you too much. He got scared. Have you, <laughs> what are your thoughts on those? That there's two kind of there. Could someone like you so much that they're scared? I feel like this you is made a question a for me. I know that's her too. <laughs> you I'm like, jump. can I ask a specific question for me and then a question for the ladies? <laughs> there was like the moment where you say, firstly, when someone says, I, I'm intimidated by you. Or, They're not saying it. Girls are assuming that guys oh, feel that way. Well, yeah, that one is a bit of a jump, I think. Okay, say more. Do you think men are intimidated by women? Because a lot of women now are powerful. They have yes. full time, you know. Okay. Yes. I, I think there's a, well, I think there's a percentage of men that are intimidated by it a person that can do anything <laughs> and then it's all a spectrum from there. Yes. Right. Yes. So the, the, and then, and then there's men on the opposite side of the spectrum that really, you know, enjoy and celebrate powerful women. But I think that there's a lot of people in the middle of that, mm-hmm. that are trying to figure out if they're important or if they're necessary That's a good one. and where their power comes from. And, okay, if, you know, we might say, I, well, they should know where their power comes from and it should, you know, they should already have figured that out. But that's also not entirely fair because people, we, there are plenty of women too who are like, I really want, you know, I, it's nice when someone helps me to believe in myself or to realize what's special about me. And it, it can't all be that. It has to be some of it has to come from us, but it's a bit of a dance, right? We, mm-hmm. I think great relationships, we we come to it with a sense of our power, but we also meet someone who makes us feel even more powerful mm-hmm. by the way that they celebrate us. And I think that what can get lost is the in trying to impress people We forget that we need to also connect and we need to also celebrate. Mm. And our insecurity makes us so desperate to impress that we end up intimidating instead of connecting or celebrating. That. That's a good one. Yeah. And I I think it's huge because it's, 
That's a good one. It's so easy to go on a date and talk about all the things that are great about us or how much we've achieved or how much we've earned and whatever it is, it's always going to be like our thing that we feel has given us status mm-hmm. or our, whatever we've worked hard on or whatever we f- get our validation from tends to be the thing we, you know, like wear the heaviest. But it's also the thing that can, it, it can disconnect us from somebody else because we're no longer in a place of curiosity or connecting or learning what's great about them. I Some of the most amazing one. people I know make other people feel uh, the best. They, I know. Jay Shetty. Yeah. Literally. Yeah. The, like makes you feel like a million freaking bucks. Yeah. You're just 100%. like Mel, you know. People that we both know, it's like, I'm like, I, I'm like, oh, that's, it's you not why. You don't come why. away going, they're so intimidating. Yes. And, and they're extraordinarily accomplished yep. people. Mm-hmm. There's a, there's a great, um, oh, who was it? Shakespeare. Uh-oh. It was full, I think it was sort of full stuff, not just a wit, but a cause of wit in others. It's a great line, that idea that you're, you're not, you can be a wit, Mm -hmm. but if you're a cause of wit in others, then you're really attractive to be around. Wow. That's in like 48 Laws of Power too. Right. Yeah. You make other people feel funny. You make other people feel smart around you. Mm -hmm. You feel, make other people feel interesting around you. Then you're someone everyone wants to be around, but we don't do that when we're insecurely trying to impress. So- I do think that's an that's an element of it, but I don't. I I absolutely know that it's also a very real thing that women who are going into situations where they don't need a guy for the typical things that guys have been raised to think make them important or necessary make men feel intensely, make some men feel intensely uncomfortable because. It's like you took away all his weapons. And if you don't think your weapons are more interesting than how you can provide or how, you know, accomplished you are in your career or whatever it may be, then you're in trouble when you meet someone who can go toe to toe with you on that or Mm -hmm. frankly has done more with you in that department. You're in trouble. So I think there's a real, I think there's a real issue today of men needing to figure out what their source of power is outside of the ways that they were brought up by previous generations to to think is their power and women in many cases needing to be more okay not finding a guy who is has is matching them in all of the same areas Mm -hmm. that they have been successful Mm -hmm. because i think there's there's a lot of that there's a lot of women saying i want to meet a great guy who's also at my level in the food chain in the company and who's also making Mm -hmm. as much if not more than me Mm -hmm. and not everyone is like that but there's a decent that i've seen it enough Mm -hmm. to think oh that's like an adjustment that would make a lot of people happier if they could stop telling themselves a story that a guy has to has to be that and instead go Surely the reason I did all of this was so that I could pick whoever the hell I wanted. <laughs> what was the point otherwise? Wow. Yeah, I do feel like a lot of women are just kind of burnt out. They're like working, they're doing all the things, they're taking it on so much. That's kind of the collective conversation that I'm hearing. And a part of that means that they're kind of leading the charge of of the dating. And, you know, even like being someone that loves your content, it is, it's mostly women, which I love, but I do, there's a part of me sometimes that gets a little bit, um, I get a little like frustrated that I feel like women are doing self-work, we're in therapy, we're in the jobs, we're running the households, and then we're also responsible. It feels like this for me, and so I'd love the reframe. It feels like we're also taking on all the responsibility of dropping the handkerchief, being in the right Uh spot, texting him the right thing, doing the, it's like, then we're like having the task of like being the best person for dating. How do you feel about that? Like, do you ever, do you feel like it's imbalanced? Do you feel like men are putting in as much effort as women? Like. I think men are doing their version of growth work that they think is important. Mm Mm-hmm. 
And I think it's often different from the version of growth work that attracts women. Yes, say more. Like, you can't look at the rise of someone like Jordan Peterson mm -hmm. and say men aren't interested in some kind That's of... That's true. Because they are. That's true. It's just that Jordan Peterson does not appeal to many women. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> like... He, I mean, I'm sure he does some, yeah. but you know what I mean? Like yeah. you don't associate Jordan Peterson with yeah. a big female following. You associate him with men. And and the scale at which he has mm -hmm. attracted men to him is staggering. Mm -hmm. What's going on there? Well, clearly these men, there's some kind of, you know, actual, because so, he's not, yeah. they don't follow Jordan Peterson to complain. Mm -hmm. They, or, because he's not someone who celebrates complaining. Mm -hmm what you can't love or hate and what you can say is that there's a strong element of self-actualization mm -hmm. to what he's talking about. And that an enormous number of men seem to resonate with that version of mm -hmm. self-actualization. And then there's huge female thought leaders or thought leaders that attract women that seem to resonate with women differently. Um, so, I guess in some ways the question is whether the two line up, mm -hmm. whether the things men are learning is what women feel like mm -hmm. they actually need them to learn yes. mm -hmm. and whether the things women are mm -hmm. vice versa. Right. Mm -hmm. um, which is an, I've never talked about that before. I don't, I, this isn't me saying something I've said a thousand times, but I, I do think there's something interesting in that, yeah. that maybe they're both, both are learning, but are they really learning the things that they wish the other would learn? Mm -hmm. Um, one thing I think that happens a lot is that a woman who is used to making things happen and a woman who is used to going out there and learning and doing growth work and being proactive and doesn't necessarily know when to pause and say, his turn now. Yes. <laughs> like, or I'm not going to enable this behavior here by stepping in and filling in the gap or by, um, you know, making the decision or like, I'm going to create space for this person to step into. Mm -hmm. And so I think that there's a kind of, we often create, I, oh God, I want to be so careful when I say this, because I do think there's men suck a lot. Mm -hmm. Like I really do. But I also yeah. think that there's a, we sometimes enable the very dance that we hate. You of course. By, there's a, we're both in the dance. Yeah, and and we're. I hear it's you. It's like a. It's often like you know if you take a people pleaser mm -hmm. who's resentful of of their friends or their family, we don't like the fact that we're doing everything and that we're feeling taken advantage of and that they're never. It's not an equal relationship, but there's often something about an equal relationship that scares us. Like we don't we're used to playing the role of the person that complains that we do more than other people do. But why is it we're having such a hard time standing back and letting them do more? Why is it when we have a conversation with them and say, you know what? No, I'm not going to do that. And we say, and we say, no, why is it we then feel guilty for three days? And if, when that person doesn't call us, we call them and we say, I'm so sorry. I was having a moment the other day. Let me sort that out for mm -hmm. you. Like, mm -hmm. why is it we go and fix it? It's because we're more comfortable being the person complaining that when that they're not doing enough, then we are demanding that this person treat us as their equal. We're not used to playing the role of the equal. So I think that there's a lot of that in relationship dynamics too. Whereas like people will complain about, let's say the way a guy is, mm -hmm. But it's like, but then why do you keep giving to this guy? And if you don't like the fact that you're the one initiating, why don't you stop initiating? Or why don't you have the conversation that says, hey, honestly, I like you, but I feel like I'm always the one initiating and that's not the kind of dynamic I want to be in. It's not interesting to me. So I'm, I want you to know because I'm, I feel myself starting to pull away. And then you do that. You actually do mm -hmm. that, not as a tactic, but a standard. There's a big difference. Stand tactics aren't standards. Tactics are what you do when you try and get a result. And then if you don't get the result, you just change the tactic. Mm -hmm. Standards is what you do when it's who you are. And there's a lot of people I see who are complaining about people not doing enough, but they're not willing to 
stop playing a role that they feel very comfortable playing and start playing a, a different one. Mm. In Jordan Peterson's work, he talks about the concept of the devouring mother. And there's mm -hmm. this dynamic between like men and women that basically it's like the woman almost becomes the mother, the men then, yep. you know, you know that dynamic. But yeah, it's just so interesting. And I love men. It's not like a thing against men. I just do notice that there is sort of a balancing that's happening or there's like women over-indexing, overdoing, like over-functioning, doing everything, da-da-da-da, just trying to take care of everything. And then the men are almost like adjusting to that and stepping yeah. back and kind of not doing anything and then being punished for it. There's like, yeah, there's a lot of like psychic conversation that's happening that people aren't really speaking to one another about. Um, I, I think it's a combination of if, I, I feel like it's just a, there's a lot of analogies between that and like hiring. You know, there are people that won't on their first week on the job be proactive. Yeah. And you, they're so frustrating because you're like, why aren't you asking me if I need anything? Or why aren't you like stepping forward and taking mm -hmm. charge of that? Why am I having to ask for this three times? Why, when you said you would do this, am I having to ask if you've done it? Like there's all these little frustrating things. And you know, uh, some, I think sometimes very quickly you have to go, if I'm, if already I feel like I'm putting in this much more, then this isn't a right fit. And let me stop, let me not waste six months complaining about this. Let me just get out. Mm -hmm. But also that employee, there's nothing wrong with saying to them, if you're like really wondering, could I, you need closure about whether they could be better. There's nothing wrong with saying to that employee, hey, I, I don't know if you're not being proactive right now because you're just shy and you're finding your feet mm -hmm. or you may be being too polite or too like in your head, but this is the kind of thing I need from you. Mm -hmm. Like I, I need you to think about this. I need you to be proactive. I need you to, okay, if in week two or three or four it improves, then you're like, okay, maybe it was just like early nerves or maybe it was them just not knowing. Maybe they just needed to be told. Like, this is important to me. And they're like, oh, I, I didn't realize I was being so mm -hmm. passive. Yes. I thought that's what you wanted me to be. Yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so saying that to someone yes. is fine. But pay attention quickly to whether there's progress. And I think that there's, I just see a lot of people not necessarily doing, they're either staying with someone too long and ignoring those early signs that this person's not the kind of person that's actually going to meet you there as a teammate. Mm, yeah. Or they're not having the conversation at all. And then evaluating very soberly whether there's progress mm -hmm. or not. And that, and then you can land in a situation for months or years with someone who's just constantly takes advantage of you. And the deeper you get mm -hmm. into it, the more you're like, it's the sunk cost fallacy. Yeah. You're like, all right, I got to try and make it work now. Mm -hmm. I've given it so much time and energy. Mm hmm I'm fascinated, you know, growing up in a household where my parents didn't talk about stuff really, like weren't, you know, what I perceived, maybe they were behind the scenes, but it's like now that's such a priority for me and my next relationship is like clear up, open communication. Like communication is everything. Like even being like, hey, the story I'm telling myself is that you're not as interested and you're not as invested because yeah. you, you're not planning dates. Like, can you help me to see the truth? And then they could be like, you know what? I didn't even know if you wanted me to do dates. You've planned every date for the next three weeks. Like mm -hmm. we're good. You know what I mean? It's like, then you can really kind of see the truth of things. And it just helps so much to give people the opportunity to stand up, to show up and like to really support you in, in what you're doing. Um, part of this that we're talking about is the true investment versus like a superficial surface investment. And I think that was something I wanted to, to mention was what would you see the difference between a true investment and superficial surface one? Because I think a lot of women get it confused where it's like, he's liking my stories. He's responding to my texts. And like, it's not like a real investment mm -hmm. in the relationship. I would, in those situations, I'm always like, give another, give 1% more mm. and see if it goes anywhere. Mm -hmm. See if, you know, what happens when you respond to one of his stories with a DM that does he actually write back? Yeah. And, you know, it's like someone texting someone endlessly on a dating app. You really want them to ask you out. Well, then take one, put in 1% 1 more and see if they go there mm -hmm. with you. You know, my wife Audrey has a, a line where she's, you know, says, hopefully not anymore. 
to anyone. <laughs> yeah, she, this says, is, she used to say, <laughs> we buried she, this. <laughs> she, she says, um, you know, if you asked me out, I would totally say yes. Mm, you know, if you've been texting that. someone for a while and you say that, that you're, you're going the extra 1% mm. or 5% to see if they can meet you there. And that's something we don't do enough is we're like, why, why is this person not taking the lead? But Make it clear to them you want them to take the lead mm -hmm. or you should give me a call later. It'd be great to hear your voice. Mm -hmm. um, I love that. You know, we're, I, I think that we are, <sighs> Mitch Album said, if you don't like the culture, you have to be brave enough to create your own. And that's a really important idea in life in general. If you don't like the dating culture, yeah. then don't become a victim to dating culture decide the culture you want to have and then model that culture. And if they can't meet you there, don't keep modeling that culture for yeah. them. Move on. But, My job is to model. <laughs> <laughs> but, but model it just enough that they, you set a new standard. I love that. It's like, it, this is so practical to me. I know it sounds abstract, but for me, I'm like, I've had this in friendships with people where you text each other and you kind of get into this groove of, we always text. Mm -hmm. The moment someone, instead of sending a text, sends a voice note and just gives a slightly more elaborate and longer mm -hmm. answer. You know, how's your day? And you thought you were just going to get a good thanks. How's mm -hmm. yours? And instead you get a voice note and you're like, well, it's, to be honest, man, it's been a tricky day because blah, mm -hmm. blah, blah. And it's uh, anyway, that was a hard thing today, but uh, I'm glad I hear, heard from you. Or what It's like, Oh my God, there's a, we just, you, you just upgraded our relationship mm -hmm. a little bit because we don't normally do that. Mm -hmm. it, I had a guy in a coffee shop that I go to just two days ago say to me, we only ever just exchange pleasantries. And then the other day he, as he was walking away to the coffee bar, he goes, can I get you a coffee? And I remember thinking afterwards, like he just like, mm -hmm. he just upgraded. You're like, like I see you. Yeah, like we're, we're on another level yeah, now because yeah. you just offered mm -hmm. me a coffee and it's mm -hmm. just a little thing, yeah. but it says, it's like you pushing the relationship 1% forward. Now, if the person doesn't respond to that, then okay, you, that's the time to mm -hmm. say this person's a bad bet right now. But I think that we call things bad bets before we've done any modeling. I think we over mirror and under model. Mm -hmm. So in our dating lives, mirroring means you just become a, you just become part of the culture. People are indifferent, so you're indifferent. People act cool, and I don't care. Mm -hmm. I, I don't care. Like you act cool, then you just become part of it. You you yeah. know if you have a great date with someone and then you don't really hear from them for two weeks and you you're like oh, this really hurts. I had a great mm -hmm. time with this person, blah blah blah. And then two weeks later they message you, and they're like, how you doing? What are you up to today? You've got a couple of options. Mm -hmm. One is to mirror. And it's really tempting to mirror because you're like, I don't want them to know that I really have mm -hmm. been thinking about them as much as I have and that it made me anxious or that it made me hurt that after a great date, they didn't really message me. So, you know, all of this amounts, I, I, I'm going to play cool and indifferent. Mm -hmm. And so they text you saying, what are you up to? You're like, oh, I'm good. You know, I'm just doing this. What are you up to? And instead of communicating any of the things we want to communicate, all we have done is mirror them. Mm. So now that has become a tacit approval of the inconsistent communication that you've experienced from them. They are, they have no idea what your intentions are because you're not showing any intention at all. You're being as intentionless as they mm. are. And we think that we're somehow doing ourselves a favor by responding back in this mm -hmm. cool and different way that they are. If instead we model, now modeling might look like we didn't leave it two weeks before yeah. reaching out to them again because we wanted to show that this is, or we even called them or whatever. We did something that showed this is the level I want. You're not going to keep doing that. The standard comes in when they don't give it to you back and you say, okay, I'm going to back off now. But you give them you model so that they see the standard that you have for yourself and the kinds of people you interact with. That starts to show intentionality. The, I had a friend who 
went away for a few days after date, uh, being on a few dates with someone and the person he was dating didn't hear from him. And she said, uh, when he got back, she said, it hurt me that you didn't call me while mm. you were away. It made me feel like you were sharing, maybe you were sharing your bed with someone else. Mm. And he ended up in a relationship with that person, even though in his mind at that time, it was like, he was probably dating multiple mm -hmm. people and whatever. He was in a like kind of casual place. Something about her intentionality mm -hmm. actually steered him on a different path because he was, and by the way, it can even be, intentionality can even be sexy. Mm -hmm. It's like the first time someone gets a bit jealous. Mm -hmm. There's something sexy sometimes about that. So true. They're like, oh, that's, so well, that means we've reached a stage where you can yes. be jealous. Yes. That's like a, like a graduation. Mm -hmm. You don't get jealous of someone on date one. Yes. But like if by date three or four, someone says that made me a bit jealous. You're like, oh my God, that feels good. Mm -hmm. So it's, but we don't want to be jealous because that's vulnerable and mm -hmm. that's going to show I like you too mm -hmm. much. That's the problem yeah. is that we're just mirroring instead of modeling and all the power is in the modeling, but combining modeling mm -hmm. with a standard about what someone has to give you for you to continue to invest on that level. Mm -mm 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 -mm. So good. I could talk to you for <laughs> ever, the rest of ever. Um, what is one thing you want people to get from love life? Oh man. They could take something from it. The, there's so many, but like go slow to go fast. Mm -hmm. Realize that um, love needs space. What's the go slow to go fast? racing into something yeah. with someone because you th want the title of being in a relationship, it will actually be the longer way around because then it won't work. And then you'll circle back in five years and you'll find yourself back to where you started. And, um, and if you had just held out and created space, not by micro dosing on some person from your past by texting them every few days and occasionally having sex with them and mm -hmm. keeping them in your life in a way that makes it hard for you to micro dosing that's hilarious think of someone else mm -hmm. like it's that stuff is poison because someone can't enter your life when there's not space and even if only one viable person enters your life a year well when that person comes along is there space or are you head in phone preoccupied with someone who's not texting you back? Like that's, that's what I mean by sl go slow to go fast. Love needs space. Standards create attraction. Mm -hmm. They're not something that turns people off. They actually mm -hmm. create attraction. They're one of the key ways to create attraction. So the irony is we don't have standards because we're too worried about attracting someone. Mm -hmm. And we don't realize that standards are actually a catalyst for attraction. Um, and, and I think understanding that happy enough is a superpower mm -hmm. that if you can get to happy enough, even while you're single, that is a superpower because happy enough, you don't have to be blissfully happy. You can even admit that if you met the love of your life, you might be happier. There's no shame in that, mm -hmm. but, but being happy enough today is what allows you to go slow, to go fast. It's what allows you to say no when the wrong person comes along. Cause you're like, I don't need you. I can be, I can be happy enough without you. It's what allows you when the right person to come, comes along to be yourself because you're not thinking if I lose this person, I'll never recover. That, that superpower is where we end up at the end of this book. And, um, it's the, the whole book is designed to be a, a co-pilot for anyone who's looking for love and anyone who wants to, do love better. Um, and I'm really, really, really excited about it. Are you proud? I'm so proud. I, it's been my, you know, this has been my life in private for four or five years now. Wow. You wrote it for four or five years. I started in 2019. What? 20 part of 2018 and then 2019. You got kind editors. Well, I didn't tell my publisher for a long time. Oh, bless. Okay. No, I, I didn't That's because I didn't want them to know that I was working on it. <laughs> yeah. um, but it took me a it took me a long time. I wrote this book from all different stages of my life. I wrote there's chapters of this book that I wrote being single and dissatisfied. Mm. There's chapters I wrote 
wondering if I was ever going to meet my person. There's mm-hmm. chapters that I wrote when I was in really tremendous heartbreak. Uh, parts of it were written when I was dating my wife. My final edit of this book mm-hmm. I did while I was on my honeymoon for two mm-hmm. days. Like, and literally this book has seen me through so many different wow. phases of my life. So this wasn't a book written by a, a, a married person. It was a book written by someone on all the by a huge same, loser. like, yeah, <laughs> by a, <laughs> yeah, a giant loser. A giant loser. Um, wow. I, yeah, I, was, just... I, was, I, I, I really relate to the different things that people go through. Yeah. Um, and it, it was, I, I know that, I know that feeling when we worry we're not going to meet someone and, um, you know, I, I, I had a woman say to me, this is, I have a, every year I have a very tiny group of people that I coach throughout the year. Mm. And, uh, one of the women in this group said to me, I need you to help. This was her question to me. But bear in mind, a lot of people come to me and they're like, I want to find love. Can you help me? This person said, I want you to help me kill my desire to find love because wow. I've never found it. And if I keep having this desire, I'm going to always be sad and that's going to ruin my life. So she wasn't even about how to find love. She was about how to kill the desire for it because she just felt like she would never be happy for as long as she desired love in her life. That is as real as it gets. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And um, I wrote this book for for people like her too, to say it's, you know, how do we how do we manage the feelings that we get when we're looking for love, mm-hmm. which can be exquisitely painful mm-hmm. and can lead to some really dark times in our life and can make us think we're broken, that we're going to be left behind while all of our friends get paired off. And can make us think that it's it's all our fault. And also can make us feel a lot of shame and desperation for wanting to find love in the first place. Mm-hmm. When wanting to find love is not a shameful thing. It's a human thing. We all want to find love. There is nothing shameful about admitting that you want to find love or that admitting that it's the number one thing you'd like to find in life. Most people, if they were honest, would say that. Mm-hmm. But they don't because they're worried that they'll be seen as desperate or that it's embarrassing or and also to help people realize it's, it, it is hard. It, it just is. Even without any of our internal obstacles, which we all have, it is hard to find love. It is an area we do not feel like we control the way that we do other areas. If we want to lose weight, we can ha- get on a certain diet and we can train every day and we may not get our perfect body, but our body will change. In our love life, we can go on a date every day for the next Mm -hmm. six months. And at the end of it, you still may not have found your person or you find someone you think is your person and then they cheat on you and leave you and you're back to square one. It's a, for many people, that is a utterly demoralizing process to put themselves Mm -hmm. through constantly. And yet, no matter how much we say I'm done, it doesn't change the fact that we lay in bed at night and feel lonely, mm-hmm. that we wish we could meet someone. We may not ever want to date again, but that doesn't mean we never want to find love again. Mm-hmm. And so <laughs> this book is, is to help people like that have a co-pilot for finding love, mm. um, but also to, to learn to enjoy life along the way as well as uh, simultaneously while you're seeking that love so that um, your love for life is never dependent on finding that love. Um, but it's not a defeatist book. It's very much like it will, this will help you find love, but it's that paradox of also helping you do just fine mm-hmm. in the times where you don't have it. And if you're trying to get over it, how to get over it as well, because there's mm-hmm. entire chapters on that too. Thank you. Thanks for having me. And uh, for anyone who wants a copy, by the way, it's at lovelifebook.com. 
Um, it's called Love Life, How to Raise Your Standards, Find Your Person and Live Happily No Matter What. And I'm doing a live event on the 4th of May mm. uh, called Find Your Person, which is designed to be a great partner to the book. It's only for people who get a copy of the book. Um, but for everyone who gets a copy, the book's going to give you all of the ideas and the awareness. And then the event is going to put you on the path to finding your person over the next year, if that's what you want. It's kind of my answer to what would I do if I was single again this year and I really wanted to find someone and me taking people on that journey. So if you go to lovelifebook.com, you can order the book from any retailer there, uh, but keep your receipt and then come back to that page and uh, put in your receipt and you'll get a free ticket to my event on Ooh, May, 4th. May 4th. Yeah. We'll have that in the show notes for all of you to make sure. And then for the book to make sure you get it, I've read parts of it and it is amazing. It's so good. You're such an amazing writer and speaker. Thank you. I'm so grateful for your work. Thank you for coming. It's been a pleasure. <laughs> we love you guys. We'll see you soon. Bye. Thank you so much, Matthew. Again, I had the best time talking to you. I really appreciate your work. I really appreciate you. It was such a pleasure. The book is Love Life and you can go to matthewhussey.com to get it now. Thank you all so much for listening. Be sure to subscribe to Almost 30 everywhere you listen to podcasts. So our new episodes, which come out every single week, will be there ready for you. And please share this episode with a friend. I know y'all are going to be talking about this one with your girlfriends and your family, maybe even maybe your book club. I don't know. Let's start something. I love you all so, so much. We will see you on the next one. We love you guys. Bye.